So we will be going now to hear from my friend and colleague, Jennifer Durking. So Jennifer was the brains and bronze behind the Keystone Species uh, cards. I know you've been dying since Doug Tallamy's talk to find out what are our own local Keystone Species plants. And if you go to the Bringing Back the Native Garden Tours website, look under Keystone Species, you'll find 43 of them with these beautiful cards that Jennifer has designed. And you'll be able to see the signs this year in the garden tour in the gardens. So I'm delighted now to introduce Jennifer, who'll be talking about Keystone Species for Sunny Areas. Jennifer, I'll take it, hand it to you. Thank you very much, Kathy. Um, just a quick qualifying question here. Is Glenn supposed to speak first? This is Glenn from the Golden Gate Audubon Society. And we have been working closely together over the last year on the Keystone Species cards, on the chalk up, uh, chalk pop-up event that'll be taking place in Berkeley. And I asked Glenn to come and talk about Keystone Species and the importance to birds. So Glenn, I'm sorry I pushed past you. If you would take some time, I'd be glad. That's quite all right. You've got a, a very full schedule today. So it's, <laughs> it's, it is our pleasure at Golden Gate Audubon to partner with Bringing Back the Natives and Kathy uh, to support the creation of um, the materials um, detailing the, the critical Keystone Species um, I, you've, Kathy has mentioned, and I'm sure Doug has mentioned, and you've heard, you've probably heard everybody talk about the, the crisis in, um, in our bird populations. And while the, the, the causes and solutions are complex, there is just so much reason for hope. Um, so, you know, just thinking this year, we had bald eagles returning to nests in Alameda after over a hundred years of absence. Uh, ospreys are flourishing around the bay. And efforts like this are really working to, to open people's eyes and, um, and help people make that first step to making our own backyards a critical part of the landscape to, for birds. Um, uh, I, I, once upon a time, I mean, this was maybe it was almost 30 years ago, I, I, uh, Stephen Kress was speaking to an Audubon group in New York City. And I asked him at the end of his lecture, He's Stephen Crest, for those who don't know, was the pioneering ornithologist who restored um, Atlantic puffins in Maine. And so he's a, a very successful conservationist. And I said, what's one thing that we can all do? Because we can't restore puffins in our backyards. That's just not going to happen. Um, and he said, plant an oak tree. That's what he said. Um, he went on to explain a little bit, but I'm not going to because Jennifer is going to explain why planting an oak tree is the best thing you can do. Um, I am really thrilled to, to welcome Jennifer to, to speak with us all today. Uh, um, I'm, I, I'm looking forward to having my own garden. That's if this is a this is a photograph from this morning of my front garden. Um, the all most of the plants are very teeny tiny, but one of the joys of planting with natives is that there are all these fantastic annuals that um, that you can grow from seed, like these phacelias in my front yard. Um, and so I'm 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 very excited to watch my native garden grow. Um, I just we just planted it in in December, so it's 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 quite a baby, but um, but it's very exciting. Uh, so without further ado, Jennifer, please take it away. Thank you so much, Glenn. And um, just I'm so excited to be here today to have the opportunity to talk about these keystone plants because, like you, Glenn, our garden's actually fairly new. It's just under two years old, and so um, I'm just really thrilled. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about that too. But um, without further ado, I will um, pull up my PowerPoint. Excellent. And everybody can see that uh, well? Yep, looks great. Excellent. Good. Well, as you heard earlier this morning, Doug Tallamy talked about um, including native plants in our gardens and the importance of the native plants, especially those that are keystone. And so that's what I'm going to focus in today is the keystone plants that are for sun. And um, also, if you missed Doug Tallamy's talk earlier today, I just wanted to do a really quick uh, sort of review of that that the birds and insects really need our help because um, the native plants are pretty much the only plants that our native insects, especially caterpillars, can eat. And um, this is what the birds primarily feed their young. So 96% of our birds feed caterpillars um, and other insects to their young, but the caterpillars are really the best food for them. And the plants that feed the most caterpillars are the keystone species. So the plants that the most moths and butterflies can lay their eggs on 
and that's the right food for those caterpillars. So I want to visualize that with you for a moment. Um, you all saw this earlier from Kathy and I believe Doug as well. But for those who may have missed those talks, I just want to show a quick overview of the plants to the left. All of the green bars are California native plants like oak, cherry, currant, ceanothus, also called California lilac. Those all feed um, a very high number of caterpillars, and those are the keystone plants. And to the right, the red bars are the invasive species that have been brought over. They've been imported from other countries, and these are eucalyptus and acacia and um, tea tree and periwinkle. Ice plant is everywhere. These are not feeding anything really, creating a huge food deficit. So we were so inspired by Doug Tallamy's talk two years ago that we um, started tearing out our lawn. That's the biggest crop in the United States, 40 million acres, and it feeds nothing. Um, it's not food for humans or for animals. So that is, I think, the first thing we need to tackle. And then we took out all the imported, the box hedge and the sarcococca and um, all of those uh, sort of imported plants that weren't feeding anything. We even took out those two Japanese maples you see in the front up against the house. And heavenly bamboo, which by the way, um, is poisonous to cedar waxwings. They're gorge feeders. And so if you have heavenly bamboo in your garden, I would take it out today and I would replace it with something like toyon that the birds do love. Um, and I, you know, people say, oh, that's so much work. Well, on the lower left is my husband and his sister removing the trees that took about an hour. And then we all had some lemonade. In the front middle is um, my husband taking out that box hedge. We worked on that together during the rainstorms in January. That too took about maybe three hours um, in a rainy afternoon when the ground was soft and wet. And then, you know, I work full time during the day at Stanford Medicine. And so um, here I am planting at night because when you run out of hours in the day, you can uh, plant at night. And we did all this in our front yard. As Robin said earlier, when you do things in your front yard, it's an opportunity for community conversation. And we really wanted to inspire other people. So what did we plant? We planted keystone plants and we started with manzanita. And these come, they're evergreen, they're water conserving. They come in all sorts of forms. So we have some that are ground covers. We have some that are small trees. We have some that are like shrubs. They're all covered with blossoms um, in the uh, really late winter, early spring. And the bumblebees just come out in force. They love this plant. And um, these are really versatile. They grow in full sun, but also in part shade. So um, just grow as many manzanitas as you can. And 68 species of butterflies and moths can lay eggs on this plant. I won't go into all the details about the butterflies, but this brown elfin is a beautiful shimmery butterfly and you want this in your garden. Also another evergreen uh, shrub is the California lilac or also called ceanothus. They're water conserving. They have flowers in dark purple, lavender, white, I think there's even like a golden version of them. They're beautiful and they grow like the manzanita in many different forms. So this could be a ground cover. It could be something in a pot, um, even in a balcony garden as can the manzanita. So um, really think creatively when using these plants and they do love sun. Um, there's a, I accidentally planted a dark star in part shade and it's actually doing pretty well. <laughs> so um, I'm testing that uh, theory there. But 117 species of butterflies and moths can lay eggs on this plant. And the Ceanothus silk moth is gorgeous and huge. I hope that we get one someday. And even more amazing is that awesome looking caterpillar. So again, this is food for birds. And um, we really want as many birds as we can in our gardens. Um, in a sunny spot in our yard, um, we planted a purple sage. And there's 18 uh, varieties of sage to choose from. And then also a lot of hybrids and cultivars. So these are drought tolerant. I barely water this. It suppresses all the weeds around it. A piece of grass grew up through it and I pulled that one thing out. Um, and the bees are flocking to it as are uh, some of the butterflies. I've seen nectaring on it. And um, it's actually the host plant for this adorable moth, the wavy lined emerald. It looks like a piece of jade to me, but the caterpillar, I just will take a moment to say this caterpillar is awesome. It actually takes bits of the plant and sews it onto itself with silk. And you can, if you go to iNaturalist and you search for the wavy lined emerald caterpillar, you, it'll be hard to find it unless you drops onto a piece of wood like this one did, and then you can spot it, but awesome plant and great wildlife around it. Um, oh my goodness, Lupin. I, I don't know if everyone's seeing that out in the countryside now, but we're sure seeing it over here in the um, peninsula. Um, 
on the upper left is some lupin growing in a garden. This is Lane Salinger's garden over here. And it pairs really nicely with poppies. Um, it just grows beautifully. It's a lovely shrub. It's perennial. And it has these spires of really rich purple blooms. And 75 species of butterflies and moths can lay eggs on this plant, including this beautiful Akmon blue butterfly. Um, for anyone out there who's like me taking notes wildly, I do have a QR code at the end of this and links to the talk and to all of the um, key, keystone uh, plant signs that we have. So I'll mention that later, but you will have opportunity to just download this. Um, coyote brush is awesome. This comes also, it's an evergreen, uh, drought tolerant, water conserving plant. And um, it blooms when a lot of other plants have gone dormant. So it's a great choice for the garden. Um, it has uh, especially cover for birds. You can grow it as a, as a high shrub, or you can grow it as a low growing prostrate plant, but the birds love to nest in it and they love it for cover. And they probably love to eat the 37 species of butterfly and moth uh, caterpillars that they discover um, right there next to their nests. So this is a really good one for um, a habitat garden. And this too will take full sun or part shade. So it's versatile that way. And I love this salt marsh moth. I won't go into details, but um, read the slides later or the signs and um, just fall in love with these amazing uh, creatures that are in our backyards. Um, this is a showstopper. I'm transitioning now from the evergreen perennial shrubs to some, uh, to some perennials that you can grow that uh, will add like pops of color and feed even more diverse species. So uh, here we have the um, red flower buckwheat on the top. Uh, it blooms, uh, it has a great long range bloom time. And so you get a lot of butterflies and other pollinators. And then the seeds um, for all of these buckwheats provide food for birds. You'll see flocks of little birds just feasting on these if you uh, grow them in your garden. This loves full sun. And it comes in these great colors like the, the red flower buckwheat. And then uh, below that is the California buckwheat. And then below that is the sulfur buckwheat that's a really vivid gold. And you see that up near Tahoe growing wild sometimes in the, uh, in the summer. But uh, grow these, um, as a mentor of mine once said, you will see such a variety of pollinators on buckwheat. It's like a disco on a Saturday night. That's Juanita Salisbury who created the Palo Alto Pollinator Gardens. And if you grow these, you might see a beautiful lotus hair streak like this one. So um, grow lots of these in your garden. Um, Penstemon, we're growing some of this in sun and neighbors actually stop and ask us, what is that? <laughs> so it's really beautiful and popular. It grows in full sun. Ours is in a little bit of shade and it's doing well. And 30 species of butterflies and moths can lay eggs on this plant. Um, so the gray buckeye butterfly is just one example of those 30 uh, different species. I can't decide if it's more beautiful as a butterfly or a caterpillar with these great vivid blue spikes. Um, I think this would be fun for kids to study if we grow these in our garden. Um, I'm switching over to annuals um, for a moment. This, uh, as Doug Tallamy mentioned earlier, uh, sunflowers are really, really important, not just for butterflies and caterpillars, but for the bees. Um, certain bee species really need these. These grow beautifully in full sun. They can get four foot to 10 foot tall. And um, leave the leave them on the stalk for the birds to eat in the in the late summer and fall. And sixty species of butterflies and moths can lay eggs on this plant, including this beautiful painted lady. Um, she just looks like a jewel, nectaring on some thistle. And I think equally beautiful is the caterpillar. Um, I'm sorry, I flipped back to perennials now, but I had to throw in the seaside daisy. As a friend pointed out, this grow this blooms three different seasons. It has great lavender blooms. Uh, blooms into late fall when often um, a lot of the butterflies and moths are looking for nectar sources that are late in the year. And this too is versatile about full sun or part shade and supports 24 species of butterflies and moths that can lay eggs on this plant. And the northern checker spot is just an example of one of these with a beautiful caterpillar as well. Um, ground covers are really valuable in the garden. And this particular one, all parts are edible. Um, to humans and to all of the different uh, wildlife we have in the garden. And the beach strawberry especially, it's tolerant of sandy soil. Um, it makes a great ground cover. It has these kind of shiny broad leaves and um, delicious fruit. I leave the fruit for the, for the wildlife, but it's also fun for little kids to pick it maybe. Um, and um, I want to add too that 58 species of butterflies and moths can lay eggs on this plant, including the two-banded checker skipper. 
Um, switching over to a few trees, um, we have the elderberry or Sambucus as some people call it in the Latin name. Um, it's a beautiful plant and not only does it feed 31 species of butterflies and moths, but it also has these berries that the birds just flock to. We're actually growing six of these in our small garden because um, we're so excited about that. And once again, it, one of the butterflies and caterpillars it feeds is this uh, salt marsh, marsh moth. Um, if you have a little bit of space in your yard, the big leaf maple is gorgeous. It's a large tree, um, 30 to 114 feet in height, but it changes color. It has those great fall colors, also grows in sun and part shade. 87 species of butterflies and moths can lay eggs on this plant, and some species really need the trees. And so this gorgeous morning cloak um, really needs trees to uh, lay its eggs on. And so I hope that you'll grow some of those in your garden. Um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, an oak after hearing Doug Tallamy say it is the, it supports more life forms um, than any other genus in North America. And so uh, this is actually an example of a small oak and you can actually kind of prune it to fit in your garden. Um, and it does tolerate some part shade in addition to full sun. 270 species of butterflies and moths lay eggs on this plant. That's a whopping number of, of species. We definitely want to grow that and it is the only food for this beautiful butterfly here, the California sister, as a caterpillar, equally gorgeous. Um, it uh, feasts on oak leaves and you won't even notice way up in the canopy that a few eat leaves got eaten, but we get to have these beautiful butterflies and caterpillars in our gardens. Now, some people will say, oh, but I have a butterfly garden. I have lots of beautiful plants and the butterflies come. And it's true. They will nectar on cosmos or on daisies or on marigolds. But those imported nectar plants are like a bar. So they can have a drink like pictured at the lower right, but there's no food for their offspring. You need a restaurant and that's the native plants. They provide food for the caterpillars that eat the leaves and either become bird food or become the next generation of beautiful butterflies. So um, Doug Talmy pointed out, you know, 70% is kind of the threshold where we need to be with native plants in our gardens. So if you just love your grandmother's cosmos, grow some of those, have a little bar in the corner, but definitely have a restaurant with the rest of your yard. Um, it's really critical. Um, this is our garden now. We tore out that hedge, we tore out the lawn, we put in a small courtyard and we have manzanita, growing all around it. We have sage, we have ceanothus, and this is the sunny area of our garden. Um, we also have penstemon and beach strawberry and seaside daisy pictured along the bottom there. Um, all of these are, are feeding the ecosystem and they're not just feeding the caterpillars, but they're being visited by bees, hummingbirds. The hummingbirds are just zipping through our garden now. Uh, we see them all the time. And we don't even have hummingbird feeders anymore because we're growing so many plants that the plants serve as the feeders for the hummingbirds and for the birds. And we don't have to clean those out and worry about uh, passing any diseases along. And we try to aim for a full year of bloom. And I think it goes without saying at this point, don't use any pesticides or herbicides. Um, I've gardened for over 40 years. I've never touched them. I've never been down that aisle in the store. Um, they really are dangerous to plants and animals and people. They're um, carcinogenic. So we just created a resilient habitat garden. We're going to let nature work it all out. And we're doing very little um, cleanup or watering. Um, we left the leaves on the ground. We left the acorns on the ground. Um, this nourishes and softens our clay soil. This provides insulation, but most importantly, it's a warehouse of food that feeds all of these different species. And this is the key thing for us. This made the wildlife uh, really expand more than anything else we did because we saw that all of these acorns were being eaten by little insects that were being eaten by birds that were feeding birds directly. Our ground is so much uh, more nourished and softer. And um, it's just the best thing we ever did for our garden was leaving the leaves. And wildlife has exploded as a result. We've got more bees, birds, salamanders, hummingbirds, um, a whole list of birds. I actually, the list would be so long, it'd be half this page. 
So many more birds are in our garden now, and we've never seen Western bluebirds in our neighborhood. They're finally nesting here. So um, it's just thousands of more species now, and especially the insects than we ever had before. And one more great thing before I close, we're saving a lot of water. I just want to point out, this is in the slide deck if anybody downloads it, but that blue line along the bottom is typical precipitation pattern in California. The green line is the native plants that map that precipitation pattern. A lot of people say I'm growing drought tolerant plants from Australia or the Mediterranean. That's the yellow line. It needs summer water. So instead of that really low water use, you're still with a quote drought tolerant plant having to water it. And the most egregious consumer really is that red line along the top, which is lawn. Again, the largest crop in the United States that feeds nothing. So I think that is uh, the thing that we really need to do. And for us, we're not, we don't even have an irrigation system. We're just doing a little bit of watering by hand to supplement what nature provides and what these plants are used to. Um, finally, I, I am so excited to, um, to A, say take action and B, um, talk about these keystone plant signs that Kathy and Stephanie Pergola and I worked on together. These keystone signs, the link is here. Um, you can use them in your garden. You can use them in public gardens. They're great for schools and classrooms. Um, there's a nursery um, actually in Mill Valley that's gonna start using them um, and at events. And what these signs are is pretty much all the slides I showed you, plus I think about 20 more are all captured here on these signs. And they're a great way to kind of educate the community about what these native keystone plants can do and um, some of the data about them. And then a QR code linking to Calscape and uh, where people can uh, learn more about the plants on the signs in great detail. Uh, Calscape's an amazing resource. And I just have to do a shout out to the Golden Gate Audubon Society for supporting these signs um, and for Kathy Kramer for coming up with the idea a year ago over a little French lunch in San Francisco, I think it was. Um, it's just a great resource and a lot of fun. So um, download the signs. Uh, you can print them. You can use them any way you want for free. You just can't sell them. Uh, explore the native gardens. I know Kathy has a pitch for this, but I'm telling everybody about the in-person garden tours. Uh, May 6th and 7th. The details are here. And then start growing those keystone plants today. Go to the nursery today. Start growing these in your garden. And um, here are QR codes um, if anybody needs to download these. And I think I stayed within my 20-minute allotment. We got a late start. <laughs> you did. So thank you very much. That was a fantastic presentation, Jennifer. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. So um, Stephanie, maybe you can help me look through the chat and see if there's any questions. So um, Let's see. One thing I saw that isn't relevant specifically to Jennifer, but I'll answer. Somebody said, where are the plant lists for the gardens? And I want to say every garden that's on the upcoming tour, all 55 of them, have plant lists on their garden page. So you can go to the garden page and look at the plant list. It's near the bottom. Um, so Jennifer, you've worked on your front yard so far. Is that right? And you're starting on your back? Yes. We can't wait, actually. We are chomping at the bit. Uh, you know, we um, we kind of gave ourselves a little kick, and I recommend everybody do this. We were we were at about, I think, 50% native, and um, there was one evening in November when I saw the deadline for signing up for our garden tour, the gngt.org uh, is their website, the uh, Growing Natives Garden Tour. And I said, I think I had a glass of wine, and I said, why not? just sign up and be on the tour. And that just lit a fire under both of us. And we did so much more um, getting our garden ready and our neighbors are so excited now. So now they want to plant some of the plants we planted and we're putting out free seeds for them and we're putting out free plants. And they're starting, there's four more gardens starting on our block because of this. So it's very, very exciting. Backyard is next, and that's going to be, I'm going to call it bird riot. We're just going to grow so many things for birds along our riparian corridor. Would you like to talk for a moment about the um, wildflower program, the seed? Oh, sure, sure. I, I wasn't rolling it into this, but yeah. So, um, you know, I got to tell you, I got so fired up about native plants, and it was really Doug Tallamy's talk. And especially, I, I watched the one for CNPS, and I watched the one for um, the Bringing Back the Natives Garden Tour that was more oriented to California. And I got so fired up, I thought, I can work in my own garden, but it's not enough. What else can I do? And I started sharing free seeds on Nextdoor. And oh my goodness, the word free on next door, you can, you can give away anything. So I started giving off, you know, maybe a 50, a hundred packets. It's now 3000 packets of seeds that I've distributed. 
partner now with CNPS Santa Clara for the Wildflower Ambassador Program we created. And um, so through them in our, in our district, we're distributing free seeds um, for anyone who's in the C, uh, CNPS Santa Clara Valley chapter area. But I personally am happy to, to share seeds or share seed links with people. Um, so I have kind of, you know, two hats I wear there. But and anyway, it's great. Would you give contact information for the next door group that you started? Oh yeah, it's actually on this, um, it's on this uh, slide right here, if that's still visible, it's along the top. So if people wanna email me for free seeds, there's my email. ND is next door. That's the next door group that I started. And um, next door, it kind of goes beyond the CNPS or any boundaries because um, on the next door group, um, people can join from actually anywhere. And we can have a robust conversation, share ideas, share seeds and share, um, you know, information about talks like this one, you know, I think we had 9,000 people in a gardening group, another gardening group that's associated in San Jose saw the, saw about this uh, talk and I think some of them have joined. So it's a great resource. So may I type in Cassie, do we have a moment? Just um, a couple of things people brought up and one yeah. that came up in another presentation um, about, you know, Doug said, oh, 70% of natives in your yard and you'll kind of that that's what's necessary to to keep uh, our, um, you know, the caterpillars uh, at a healthy number. Um, one thing somebody shared that I want to pass along is if you're just starting out, really just start replacing non-natives, any number of um, native plants is a great step and a great success and you will see the difference right away I can um, attest to that from my own yard but I think it would be nice to get a bit of clarification on that number is that biomass is a number of plants is it a different species um Kathy and Jennifer what's the word <laughs> I in, I think it is by cover I think it's 70 percent by cover Glenn you tell me if you have a different opinion about what he means by the 70 percent whoops you're muted um um that's that's my understanding as well is that it's 70 percent by cover uh not by biomass um uh so but even so that means you know planting an oak tree you know this, I, this when i give lectures on gardening for birds i say if you've got an oak tree in your yard you know you're you're consider yourself blessed if you don't have one just wait because the birds will plant one for you. Just don't take it out. <laughs> Let it grow and nurture it. Um, because that really, because those, not only are they the, the most critical keystone species here, uh, but they also provide a lot of cover for their, you know, for their relatively, you know, small space. I mean, not that an oak tree is small, they're huge, but, um, but they, you know, their, their canopy covers a lot of, of ground that you could plant other things under. Um, and it's the canopy cover that's really what matters. Yeah, and I'd like to dovetail on what Glenn just said, because we um, we moved to our house in 2007. We didn't start gardening uh, na with native gardens till 2021. For all those uh, intervening years, we had a gardener who came, he mowed, he blowed, and he took every scrap of litter off of our property. He removed all the acorns, he removed all the leaves. And so even though we had an oak tree, um, the different butterflies and moths that were trying to reproduce using the oak tree were swept away and taken to the garbage dump to create methane. So um, I think that's a big message. People plant an oak and then they sterilize the space under it. And so we've got to really leave the leaves. And it's hard the first year because you wind up like this deep in leaves. And then they all start to break down and they all just um, go back into nature and they're awesome. So I had to chime in about that. Yeah, no, I'm really glad you said that, um, Jennifer. It's, it's like, yeah, natives alone is one thing, but but how you have them leave the spent flowers and leave the leaves. Yeah, I can't say that enough. Thank you. Right, right. If you're if you're working to, to you know to add one plant at a time, um, Golden Gate Audubon and the um, uh, California Native Plant Society, um, your Babuena chapter have a uh, a Plants for Birds program where we've where that was that's really been our approach is let's pick four plants. Mm -hmm. that are easy to use in urban gardens that are, that no one's going to have in, have struggle with um, that are going to add some value to birds like just you know this is it's a harm reduction approach like just do a little less damage to the world and by planting a native you can just you can do a little less um and a little more good mm -hmm. uh, it's a great way to dip your toe into it um if you uh, just google plants for birds um you'll they'll, you'll find the local version of it there there are plants for birds programs all across the country 
choose the one that's closest to you and and just just start with a little something. Um, yeah. Don't have to be like me and sheet mulch the whole yard and pull out and compost every <laughs> single non-native plant that you've got there. Um, it was hard to do. I mean, I, well, the, the lawn was easy. I the, the, that's that was like you know nothing. Getting rid of the lawn was that was it was easy to do and and a pleasure. I was I took great joy in <laughs> watching that lawn disappear under the sheet mulch. Um, you know, Glenn, I hope you bought a, you I, I hope you bought a hammock because there's so <laughs> little maintenance now. <laughs> um, well, uh, I want to thank Jennifer. So let me say that like my favorite people are online right now. I have Stephanie, who's been such a great colleague and help with the tour. I have Jennifer, who I just so fortuitously, I remember I told her, Jennifer Durking, I bow to you across my computer screen. Oh. That was how we met because we, I was so honored. <laughs> <laughs> we were taught, we were chatting in the gardening with natives uh, group. Um, uh, and I have Glenn who I'm sorry, I forgot you earlier, Glenn, but has been such a great partner with the Keystone species and Golden Gate Audubon is doing got so many great materials on gardening with native plants and gardening for birds. And so it's just been wonderful working with all of you. If you are watching today and haven't had a chance yet to make a donation, if you'll please support the tour. You can do it on the tour's uh, website under please donate. You can Venmo a contribution to at bringing back the natives. We depend upon donations to keep going. And we hope that if you've enjoyed our presentation, that you will help us to keep this event going.